Um, I, I'd love to wait until the last few come, come in, but uh, we've got a lot of stuff I would love to cover. And I've already kind of made sure or tried to make sure it fits within the three hours that they've given me here. So I'm just kidding. It's 40 minutes. Uh, so I, I want to jump right in. Um, thank you this, uh, for coming this morning to uh, our talk on clouds and containers, or as I like to call it, hit the high points and give it to me straight. What's the difference and why should I care? Uh, my name is Mark Heckler. I'm a principal technologist and developer advocate with Pivotal Software, Inc. Uh, Pivotal are the makers of things like the Spring Framework, Spring Boot, Redis, RabbitMQ, Greenplum, a huge contributor to Apache Tomcat, and a huge contributor to Cloud Foundry. Perhaps you've heard of us. Uh, we like to refer to ourselves as a tiny little startup in Silicon Valley. Um, I blog semi-regularly at theHecklers.org, my personal domain. And I tweet very regularly at MKHeck. Is anyone here on Twitter? OK, good handful, yeah. Uh, I live on Twitter. I always jokingly and sort of jokingly say it's my home, my home away from home. Uh, I'm there far more often than I am actually at home. Um, but uh, I'm, for those of you who aren't on Twitter, uh, I'm also a member of the slightly older and more established social network called email. Is anyone here on email? OK, a couple more, that's good. Um, again, we, the, the bad news is we have a short time here together uh, just this morning. The good news is that it, we have almost unlimited time afterwards. So if you have any questions, if you have any comments or feedback, please do uh, hunt me down. Uh, if nothing else, tweet me or email me. Um, perhaps I gave something a, a shorter treatment than you would have liked, and maybe I would have liked to have gone into more detail on it as well. Uh, so, very happy to talk at length about any of this after the fact, so uh, just hunt me down. Uh, my email address, by the way, like you, I have about a half a dozen email addresses. I always point to mark at thehecklers.org because it's, it's easily remembered. Uh, but, but do reach out. Happy to continue the conversation. So, who am I? Uh, well, I'm the author of several blogs and blog posts. I have co-authored one book uh, and have another one kind of in the, the uh, works right now. Uh, I've contributed content and code to other books as well. And I love to speak. I always kind of say this is my dream job. I get to code and I get to talk. So I, I don't see how it gets much better than that for me <laughs> anyway. Uh, thank you for inviting me back to Code Motion Amsterdam. It's an awesome, awesome um, event with great organizers and volunteers. And the venue is just superb. I love it. I'm a history nut, so uh, I love uh, buildings like this. Uh, I am a software architect and developer by trade, and as you might imagine from the next bullet point, uh, most of my expertise lies within the JVM. Uh, I was recognized last year as a Java champion by my peers for contributions to the greater Java community, and if you had anything to do with that, uh, thank you very much. So, um, kind of today, what are the high points? Uh, well, first, what is this container stuff of which you speak? Uh, who is actively containering right now? Who, who's using containers? Okay, who's considering it? Yeah, uh, it's, I mean, this is, this is something that's kind of unevenly distributed, right? I mean, some people are kind of dipping their toe in, some people are all in, some people are just kind of looking at it and, and thinking they should, and that's fine. Uh, I, I start off with, I don't really do a Docker 101 or a Containers 101, but I think it's important to establish some foundation from which we can discuss everything else. So I, I do kind of cover some of the basics here. Uh, how can I use containers to develop better software? That's what it's all about, right? I mean, that's why, we're, why we do what we do, is to develop software and to do it better. Uh, what are orchestration tools? Do I even need to consider them? Do I need to use them? We'll talk about that. Uh, how do cloud and platform as a service options compare? I mean, we know it's a platform. Shouldn't that include a lot of other stuff? Well, typically it does. And if so, what are the trade-offs? Uh, are they complementary? Do they, do they conflict in some way? We'll talk about that and kind of show that as we go. Uh, and again, what's the difference and why should I care? Or should I care? And everything we're going to talk about is from a developer's perspective. Are there any ops folks in the crowd? Operations? OK. Uh, managers? OK. There, there should be something in here for you to, uh, as well. Uh, so, so that, I, one, it will help you kind of understand what, uh, what developers look for in these things. But it also, I think you'll, you'll get a, hopefully get a better understanding of of how it fits within your plans uh, additionally. So first of all, I kind of like to cover this because there's a lot of confusion on what are containers vis-a-vis -vis, uh, VMs, virtual machines. <coughs> uh, does anyone remember the old days, like before six years ago? 
I jokingly call those the old days. Uh, when we deployed everything to physical machines, wow, that was tough, right? Everything was a one-off environment. Uh, virtual machines changed that a lot and didn't change that at all in some other ways. Uh, because typically you would have your infrastructure, your, your physical hardware, and you would lay a host operating system on it and a hypervisor or some means of virtualization. And then you would start uh, with a virtual machine which very much looked like, for all intents and purposes, a physical machine. You would install the operating system. You would install any kind of like application servers and supporting software packages and, and configure everything and scan it and all of these things. So it changed some things in that you could typically have more than one virtual machine running on a piece of hardware, but it didn't really change procedurally what we did. Uh, con uh, containers changed that quite a bit uh, because you still have your physical hardware underneath, but then you run something like the Docker engine. Uh, on top of, of your host operating system. And from there, you have a layered file system. Within each container, you're only layering on the delta, the changes, the dis differences between that and the underlying, typically, Linux kernel. And I do get into some of the Windows and Linux and you know, some of the other uh, cats and dogs, if you will, as I go. But, but I'm going to focus primarily on the Linux environment because that's kind of where this story mostly starts, uh, with a few certain exceptions. Has anybody heard the expression pets versus cattle? Well, in, in the, <laughs> and I say old days, obviously there are still folks using v virtual machines. They do still work. Uh, but, but when a virtual machine or if even a physical machine would get sick, when it would have problems, you would treat it much more like a pet. You would nurse it back to health. You would rush it to the veterinarian and, and try to cure it and try to heal it. Uh, and, and this was important because it was so onerous to restore, to, it was so difficult or time-consuming to replace. Whereas with a container, it's more like cattle. And apologies to animal lovers out there, I am one as well. We're just going to use this metaphorically. Uh, but if you have a large herd of cattle and one, one dies or goes missing, what do you do? Typically, you just replace the cow. So it's very much more a, a concept in that containers are much more interchangeable. They're lighter, they're easier to replace, and what have you. That's kind of a very quick overview, but uh, we'll, we'll leave it at that and continue. So how do we start on this journey? How do we start with an idea of what should be running and get there from here? Uh, first, typically within the Docker ecosystem, you create a Docker file. A Docker file is a recipe or a template that allows you to build an image from which you can create running containers that are identical to each other. So you start with a Docker file, a text file, that, that has a few key components. First, you typically list a base image. That allows you to start from an already pre-configured uh, standpoint. So it, it'll, it does a lot of your uh, initial work for you. I'm pulling in, in this example, an open JDK base image. And I'm also using the latest version of that. Now, typically, when you go into production, you, key it, you tie it to a specific version because nobody likes surprises, right? Uh, for this example, I'm just using the latest, uh, latest version. That's fine. Uh, but I'm pulling the open JDK base image and building everything off of that. The open JDK base image, in turn, has a base image. Uh, in most cases, it's Ubuntu, but they also do a build off of Alpine Linux. But regardless, I'm starting with, with much of my work already done. And then I provide some maintainer information because it's just good to document things so people know where to find you if something is wrong or something, uh, there, there are questions. And then I provide the specifics for my particular container. I'm creating a directory. I'm copying in an application. And I'm setting up how it should run. I'm setting the, the application executable to run as the entry point, And I'm exposing a specific port. This Docker file I'll use to create an image, a stored package that allows me to duplicate that as running containers eventually. This is a kind of a useful command. It's not required to use, but I think it's kind of helpful uh, to run a Docker history on an image that you may have created or that someone else has created. If you read it from the bottom up, it'll give you a better idea of what's kind of going on here. Uh, the open JDK base image is all of the blue stuff. It starts with pulling in the initial, uh, the initial Ubuntu base image, and then it does some updates to the underlying OS and uh, sets some variables and things of that nature. And then you see in the white part moving up the stack, uh, my information and the information that I'm providing to create my specific image. Kind of helpful, right? It establishes some degree of context. And if you remember the pets versus cattle screen, this is the right side of that. And that's a very Docker-centric view that I'm painting, primarily because Docker 
in many people's minds e is equated to containers. Now, I know that there were instances of containerization long before Docker came onto the scene. Uh, things like BSD jails and Solaris zones, and they were good. Uh, but Docker undoubtedly made it more consumable for more developers, more easily consumable, and, and made the processes, if you will, much more repeatable. That said, not everybody uses Docker all the way up and down the stack. Because when we say Docker, we can mean one of many things. We may mean the company, the company that originally started as, under the name DocCloud and changed its name to Docker to, to further the confusion, right? By the way, I, I should stop and tell you, um, my wife tells me I'm unintentionally funny. So if I say something funny, I probably didn't mean to. It's okay, you can laugh, it won't hurt my feelings. And if I'm trying to be funny, you can still laugh, it'll just encourage me. And I do take pity laughs, so that's fine. Uh, <laughs> so um, anyway, uh, getting back to the matter at hand. So, so uh, when we say Docker, we may mean the company, probably not, but it, it, sometimes we just use that as shorthand. Uh, we may mean the, the public repository where we can store Docker images. That's called the Docker Hub, but maybe that's what we're pointing to. But typically, when we say Docker, we mean one of two things. We can either mean the image format, as we've discussed, the image that's created that can be used to create running containers from, or we can mean the Docker engine, the runtime engine. And I won't go into the whole run C and container D stuff, at least not yet, uh, but ultimately, it can mean one of those two things most of the time when we just say Docker. Most of those times, what we're really referring to is that Docker image format. Because the Docker engine really is optional. You have other options that, that have been created by various different companies and organizations to run containers based on those Docker images. Everything kind of centers around those Docker images. So you have things like CoreOS Rocket or Joint Triton. Uh, or Cloud Foundry, or a handful of other things that can be used to run containers that are all built from these Docker images. Uh, some people actually prefer to keep an entire Docker stack. Some people prefer not to for reasons of uh, brittleness or, or um, Docker control or things of that nature. Docker has a tendency to move fast and break things. They're very innovative, but that's very disconcerting to some folks and some organizations who really feel like or really do need a certain degree of stability that they don't feel like Docker provides. You have options. So, uh, who here is a Java developer, or has been? Okay, do you remember the old promise of Wara, write once, run anywhere? Yeah, yeah, and, and Java fulfilled that in many ways and failed in many others, right? I mean, it, it, was, it was kind of an imperfect, uh, it was a great goal, but it was kind of an imperfect ending, so to speak, and they're still working on that, obviously. But uh, within the Docker realm or containerization, you hear the term PODA, package once, deploy anywhere. It's a similar concept in that uh, you, you use a Docker file to create an image that from which you can create various running containers on various different platforms. So you can run a container based on the same image on a Windows, Mac, or Linux laptop, or on a Windows, Mac, or Linux machine, a server, or a, a workstation, or in a cloud platform running, who knows, who cares, right? It's the same container that's running based on the same image. So how does this make software better? Because that's really what it all comes down to, right? Well, it increases your portability because once you create that, uh, that, uh, that uh, excuse me, that image, it's much more transportable than a virtual machine would be. It's much more self-contained than other mechanisms for deploying software. Uh, it's also immutable. Because once you create an image, you can't update the attributes of that image without creating a new image. So it allows you to audit and version control things very handily. In fact, you can't even change the tags associated with an image currently uh, when it comes to Docker images. Now, that, that, there is a change in the air for that, and I think it probably will happen. But even the tags at this point, if you change them, you create a new image. So it's immutable. You know exactly what you're getting when you get a specific image. Uh, it's faster to build, again, it's more lightweight. You're layering on the deltas for the file system. You're not creating an entire machine image. Uh, it's lighter to distribute and run as a result. And of course, you have a great availability of building blocks, pre-built images. So if you need to create a MongoDB instance, you can go out to the Docker public repo, Docker Hub, and pull down an, a base image created by Mongo. 
or Couchbase or Nginx or Apache. Uh, you have access to a wealth of pre-built images that get you started that much faster to deploying real software. Uh, and of course, as I mentioned earlier, it's consistent across platforms, across stages, development, test, production. It's consistent everywhere. So we've kind of covered the basics of containerization. Now let's talk about orchestration. What are orchestration tools? Or do you even need to consider or use them? Orchestration is a little bit of a term soup. I always kind of look for the, the simple way to start things. And, and when you start digging into that, it gets kind of fun, right? I always appreciate a good contradiction. So when you go to the Kubernetes site, and Kubernetes is one of the uh, options you have in terms of orchestration, the main page says that Kubernetes is production-grade container orchestration. And that seems pretty definitive, right? So then you kind of dig around on the site and you find a what is page. What is K8S? And K8S is just shorthand for K, Uberneti, S, the eight characters in between. Uh, so, so what is Kubernetes? Well, Kubernetes is not a mere orchestration system. It eliminates the need for orchestration. So on the one hand, Kubernetes is orchestration, but on the other hand, it's not. And this is on its, the same site. It gets a little confusing at times. So let's go back to the basics and kind of break it down from there. Orchestration is a construct or a tool set that does a lot of things, but primarily three things. It handles deployments for you. It manages multiple containers as one unit, so you, it makes things a little bit easier to handle in terms of deployments. And it maintains targeted instance counts, such as, and, and that kind of ties in with scaling. When you want 10 of this particular uh, microservice, 10 of this particular application running, it will make sure that 10 are running. So, that's not necessarily something you need to be worried about for small applications, but for larger or enterprise-grade applications, it quickly becomes a concern. Uh, some of the ors in orchestration, because uh, we, as with most things in our industry, we typically lump a lot of things into one basket. I think it's instructive to see specifically what is included in orchestration at its, at its core, and then other things that sometimes are bolted on or added in. Uh, some of the ORs, some of the things that don't really fall within the realm of orchestration, but are sometimes brought in, uh, like routing, load balancing, uh, service registry for your containers or your applications, or application configuration, which supplies configuration settings to your running applications, or databases, or middleware, or uh, message buses, or things of that nature. Those things are used frequently with a distributed system frequently with containerization, and frequently with orchestration frameworks, but they don't typically fall within orchestration frameworks yet. Now, as with all things in our industry, we're seeing more and more convergence, so we know that that's coming. But I think it's very instructive to keep an eye specifically on what is orchestration, and, and the other things realize that you can swap in and, and configure as need be to complete your entire system. So, uh, some of the key orchestration options, and this is not an exhaustive list. It's kind of the, 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 the primary ones that you might see as you start your, your journey into orchestration. Uh, first, you have Docker Swarm mode. Now, just to be really confusing, Docker several years ago, eh, about three years ago, came out with something called Docker Swarm. They realized very quickly that orchestration was going to be a big need in an enterprise environment. Uh, so, so they released a couple of tools that work pretty well together. One's Docker Compose, which lets you take uh, multiple different containers that relate to each other and provide a capability kind of as a unit. And then Docker Swarm, which kind of abstracts your underlying infrastructure and use those together. Now, there are a lot of potential reasons on why they did this. Uh, the subsequent step but suffice it to say that within a short time, Docker realized that they needed to incorporate or wanted to incorporate a lot of that functionality within the Docker kernel itself. So Docker Swarm is still supported, but now Docker Swarm mode is what they recommend. Now, what's the difference? Well, Docker Swarm mode, as I said, is baked into the, the Docker kernel itself. It's an option, uh, and it changes the way you do things. A little bit. Uh, Docker Compose hasn't been playing well, hasn't played well traditionally with Docker Swarm mode. With the upcoming release, which I believe is in July, uh, it will actually be able to be used with Docker Stack commands. And I don't want to go too far down this rabbit hole, but it is a constantly evolving uh, 
portfolio of things that they pull together to provide orchestration capabilities to you. So that's the Docker entry. Kubernetes, or K8S, is the result of a couple of Google projects, Google Borg and Google Omega. Now, these, uh, Kubernetes is fairly young, about three years old, but it's based on code that's well-tested and well-established over the last 10 years. Uh, Kubernetes is not open-sourced Google Borg. However, it's, it's, it was created based upon a lot of lessons learned with Borg. And Borg is still in use, by the way. Uh, runs all of Google's containers 24-7, 365. So it has a very impressive pedigree. It also gives you a lot more uh, granularity and capabilities, but there is additional complexity that goes with that as well. We'll go into that as we demo some things here. Um, let's see, Mesos and Marathon. Uh, so Mesos came out of, I think it was University of California, Berkeley, also about 10 years ago. And Mesos is uh, kind of an imperfect analogy here, but it's more like Docker Swarm in that it abstracts your underlying infrastructure. On Mesos, you can run Docker with Marathon, which is the uh, Mesosphere option for orchestration. You can also run Docker Swarm or Docker with Kubernetes. So you have options there as well. With uh, Rancher, Rancher Labs came out with Rancher OS, which has an orchestration package called Cattle. Get it? Rancher, Cattle? Oh, come on, nobody thinks that's cute but me? All right. I, like I, I told you earlier, I warned you, that was the best the jokes are going to get. They're only downhill from there. So, uh, sorry, in advance. Uh, so on Rancher, you can run Docker with cattle. You can also run Docker Swarm or Docker with Kubernetes. And then Triton, uh, Joyent produced Triton. Triton uh, effectively, and this is kind of an oversimplification, but it's running Docker on Solaris zones. And Solaris zones have been around for a long time, very stable, very robust. But it gives you an alternate runtime, again, for those Docker images to create containers and run them and execute and deliver software. So next, we kind of look at how do pa cloud and PaaS options compare. Well, orchestration capabilities are typically baked in, along with many other things. That's why the P is in it, platform as a service. It provides a lot of capabilities in your platform so you don't have to assemble them yourself. Maybe that's good, maybe that's bad, but it's an option. Uh, you have multiple commercial vendors like Amazon Web Services, Microsoft Azure, Google Cloud Platform. Uh, each supports containers, albeit in slightly different ways. Uh, they all take a slightly unique approach and, and have different ways of configuring to providing your containerized capabilities. So with regard to those vendor-specific clouds, they're all solid platforms, they're all from solid vendors. Uh, you yield a little bit of control because obviously uh, when you're not configuring it yourself, uh, when you're not able to dictate or, or control the path of future development, uh, you, you are kind of trusting a vendor to do that. And that may not be a big deal. It may, but that's something to keep in mind. There are also switching costs. And I'm not talking about switching costs for your company. I'm talking about for you as a developer because you may have to change scripts. Well, you will have to change scripts. Uh, you will have to change build pipelines and things like that. And if that's a big deal to you, that's something to factor in as well. If it's not, you know, that's, that's fine as well. And of course, the public versus on-premises choice is kind of made for you, right? Because all of the commercial vendors provide public cloud offerings, but not on-premises, uh, with the exception of a couple bridge type of technologies. Cloud Foundry is an open source option, completely open source, uh, in terms of its core functionality. A foundation holds all the intellectual property, a foundation of over 70 members, one of whom is my company, admittedly, uh, but numerous providers like CenturyLink, GE, HP, Huawei, IBM, Pivotal, SAP. It always kind of bothered me because, you know, I work for Pivotal, we offer a version of that, and of course each vendor offers their own value adds to, to provide some additional capabilities they hope you buy. Uh, but it always bothered me that, that we have great engineers, but I'm not sure we got the best marketing people because you have great names like GE Predix, and IBM Bluemix, and SAP HANA. And I can just picture our marketing people sitting around a table going, what are we gonna call the Pivotal version of Cloud Foundry? I know, Pivotal Cloud Foundry. It's kind of weak, right? But it is what it is. So um, all of them support containers. It's again, it's in the core product. Uh, you choose and control the underlying infrastructure as a service. You can base it on Amazon, Google, Azure. You can run it in-house on VMware or OpenStack, any OpenStack build. Uh, but it's one consistent API. 
and it's open source, which is one thing that I love and I get excited about. Uh, so you make all the decisions. Uh, I'm not going to go into this per se. It's just a different uh, alternative means of delivering uh, containers or creating containers in your running environment when it comes to a Cloud Foundry build. If you're interested in that, happy to talk about it later, but uh, uh, let's drive on. So kind of the, the, uh, the too long don't read version is that lines are increasingly blurred, right? You have a lot of different runtime engine options. You have a lot of different orchestration options. Uh, is it important to you to stay with the Docker name all the way through the stack? Or is it important not to? Uh, these are things you need to consider. Uh, what are the differences for developers? We'll kind of get into that as we go, but, but I think you'll see that there probably aren't as a lot of differences for developers, especially uh, compared to the differences for operations folks. There are a lot of differences under the hood for them. So we appreciate all the work they do to make it uh, easier for us to, to deploy software, because again, that's where we all are headed, is, is more deployment of, of better software. So ultimately, why should I care? Well, let's put a pin in that. And let's, let's get to the, the demo. And hopefully, uh, we sacrificed to the demo guides. It was well received. We'll see what happens. It's always exciting when you go live demos because nothing ever breaks, right? By the way, does anybody recognize this guy? Oh, thank goodness. OK. I, I, I worry a little when I ask that and nobody raises their hand. It's like, really? Am I in the right room? Anyway, OK. So those of you who don't know, I recommend you start with New Who and get into Doctor Who, right? OK. So let me. Let me switch this to a do, 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 mirror the displays. Ah, here we go. OK, that is just truly wretched. So let me blow this up and go here and blow this up where we can read it. And clear. Uh, oh, 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 oh. Well, that's all right. OK, well, that's good. We're, we're starting already. <laughs> um, what I want to do is show you some different options for deploying uh, a real working application to different environments. So I start with Docker Swarm mode. And, and I'm running everything locally, except for the fact that I'm going to pull the, the same image from my public Docker repository, uh, Docker Hub. And by the way, I have, oh dear, I have the link for this on GitHub, and I'll show you that at the end. So if anybody wants to, to repeat this at home, by all means do. Uh, so, the first thing I do is, uh, is create three different virtual machines to simulate a real environment, right? Simulate multiple machines running somewhere in the cloud. And I'm going to bring those together into a Docker swarm, into a cluster, if you will. And my manager one node is my leader. That's what you see up here. Uh, let me see if I can zoom in a little bit here. So you see I have three nodes, three different host names, and of course my manager one is my leader. So I'm going to go ahead and continue. The next thing I do is do a Docker service create. I specify I want one running instance, one running container. I'm going to name it quote service, and I'm going to base it off of the quote service Docker image out of my Docker repository under HecklerM. That's my repo. Uh, so of course, you know, let's see, it looks like it's running. Uh, at this point, I, I Docker uh, machine SSH into my manager one node, and I do a Docker service LS. Just like a Linux LS, it does a list of, of your running instances. or or pending running instances. At this point, it shows our target count is one. And we have one that's currently running. But uh, hopefully, uh, we'll get that running here very shortly. So I do a, uh, let's see, this actually scrolled past. I, I have the text a little too large. But otherwise, I'm afraid it'll get lost. So here, I'm doing a Docker service inspect of my quote service. And you notice up here, I have the dash dash pretty flag. That's because I'm so pretty. Okay, now come on, who laughed at that? That's just mean. Okay, it's, it's not because I'm pretty, uh, but if you leave the dash dash pretty flag off, it gives you JSON, which is great for machines and even passable for humans, but this gives you a formatted screen that you can read through pretty quickly. Uh, we see the, a few key bits. We see that the container name is quote service. Uh, it's based off of the image called quote service uh, pulled from the HecklerM repository, and it's exposing uh, a target port or a published port of 8088 to the outside world. Next, I do a Docker service PS, which is uh, a bit more informative than the LS uh, because it gives us our exact container name and it tells us specifically what node it's running on. In this case, it's running on manager one. So I'm going to go ahead and hit enter after I scale to three. Now, everything is declarative, right? We don't say run another one here, run another one there. 
change this, do that, we say, I want three. And our orchestration framework will provide three running instances for us. It makes that decision and, and allocates them where it needs to be, where they need to be. And as we can see, it runs one on each of our three nodes, which is great. I didn't provide any specification to, uh, to deploy only to certain tagged uh, uh, machines, so it, it just kind of does a round robin and distributes them where it will. Now, what if you don't want to deploy to a particular machine? What if you want to get rid of all running containers on that machine? You set its availability to drain, which I do to my manager one node. And as you can see, I don't have to specifically relocate a running container. I just say, drain this node, <laughs> and Docker Swarm mode will kill that container and spin up a replacement on a different node, in this case, worker one. So we see over here to the left that it killed the one, it shut down the one on manager one and spun up a replacement on worker one. Now I'm going to go ahead and say, nope, I just want one. And again, Docker Swarm mode brings back the count back down to one. We see it left the one running on worker two, just as it were. And I'm going to go ahead and shut down. I'm going to remove that running container. And then I do an inspect to make sure that it's removed. And I get exactly what I'd expect, which is saying, hey, I don't find this running service anywhere which it shouldn't, I just killed it. And then I'm going to go ahead and shut it down now so I can start the next uh, demonstration. Uh, in trying to do these demonstrations, they all kind of do things, similar things, but slightly differently. And I, I, I like to kind of show what each one does uh, or, or concentrates on a little bit more. I think it becomes a little more obvious that way. So the next thing I'm going to do is run a Kubernetes uh, deployment. And as you can see, there's a newer version of Minikube. That's the localized version of Kubernetes. You can run locally, available. I did not update yesterday evening. Go figure. Uh, but I figured I was taking enough chances with three live demos. I didn't want to push it with something completely new off, off the track. So it takes a little while to spin up. The one thing I do want to point out is that Kubernetes gives you, as I mentioned earlier, a little bit more granularity. In terms of Docker, at least to this point, until August, when Docker Stack comes on, uh, becomes available and how to manage different Docker um, uh, clusters, if you will, or Docker groups of Docker containers, <laughs> Kubernetes lets you define a pod. Most microsystem-based distributed systems don't rely upon one particular service to provide all capabilities that it supplies. If it has a particular capability it delivers, most of the time it's interacting with various other microservices, various other containers. Uh, Kubernetes lets you define a pod. And within the pod, you can say, I want one of this kind of, of uh, container, one of this, three of these, and five of these. And that's treated as a unit, as a pod. Now, for, for the demo, I keep it fairly simple. I keep one container running in one pod. Uh, but can, Kubernetes gives you that ability to control that, to specify that yourself. As you might imagine, that also increases the complexity somewhat. So, uh, again, you find some real fans of that and some people who aren't as, as fond of it. Uh, I'm going to show you the definition file. Again, it's declarative for a Kubernetes pod. Uh, as you can see here, kind of the key bits of information, the pod name is quote service. I'm going to create a container within that called quote service, and based on the image, uh, Hepler M quote service from the same Docker public repo, and I'm going to expose it or ask Kubernetes to expose port 8088. So it's still starting. Minikube sometimes is a bit slow, especially after, I think it gets jealous when I run the Docker swarm mode first, I don't know. But once that starts up, we'll step through some of the same steps that we did uh, with Docker Swarm mode, and we'll kind of see some of the distinctions as we go as well. Assuming, of course, this runs. Okay, we've got, we have five minutes. I think we can do this. I think we can do this. Oh, there it is, okay. So as you can see, kube control is now configured to use the cluster. One thing I didn't mention is that with all of these, you have a client which communicates with a a running kernel with a running server version, if you will, uh, for lack of a better way to put it. Uh, since I'm running all these local, that distinction is kind of blurred. Uh, but again, you can do the same thing with your local kube control or, or with uh, the Docker client, regardless of where your machines are running. So the first thing I do is create my pod, my running pod, based on the quote service.yaml file I showed you a moment ago. 
And now, uh, for the purposes of our demo, since I, I don't have load balancing and multiple pods running, I'm just going to poke a hole directly uh, into that specific pod uh, and expose that as a node port. And I'm going to do a get pod, which shows me that I have, uh, similar to, to, um, to Docker Swarm mode, I have a target count of one. And at this point, I'm running one. So life's good, right? And I'm going to curl the endpoint of the application I have um, baked into my container. And I see that it is actually returning a random quote. So that's good. That's doing what it's supposed to do. We're able to communicate with our application deployed in our container that Kubernetes is managing for us. Uh, so we have our random quote. We're good. Now I'm going to ask Kubernetes to scale, to, to take this to an instance count of two, to have two containers running. And we see one is running and one is creating. We'll go ahead and assume that that's going to create because we're short on time. And at this point, uh, I'm going to delete a pod, and we're, we're going to take a look and see what happens. So does anybody have a preference on which pod to kill? Any, any pod done you wrong? The second one? OK. So we're going to kill the new one, kill the new guy. I like that. OK, so let's do that. Well, I'm going to pop to the other uh, window. Kube, control, uh, delete, pod. Boom. OK. So now if we do a get pod again, we see there are two pods running. And you know why? Because Kubernetes is an orchestration framework. We said we wanted two running. We killed one. It spun up another. That's exactly what it's supposed to do. So it works. OK, so, so, so far, so good. We're still in good shape. I'm going to go ahead and delete the deployment and the service. And now that we've done that, I'm going to shut down Kubernetes and quickly roll into the third example and then come back and wrap up. I say quickly. Everything's relative when you're having to spin up and shut down different, <laughs> different behind-the-scenes virtual environments that you can run all of these on. OK, so the next thing I want to do is do a create PCF dev. And I'm running the local version of Pivotal Cloud Foundry, the developer's version, uh, not because I'm doing anything specific with that. Everything is generic Cloud Foundry, so it works the same on Bluemix or SAP HANA or what have you. Uh, but PCF actually has a developer's version you can load on your laptop, which I like. Uh, it's nice and uh, small, so to speak. Uh, so the only thing I really have to reach outside uh, in conference Wi-Fi is to get that image off the Docker Hub, which usually speeds things along quite nicely. Again, everything being relative. OK, and I do a little bit of housekeeping up front in case I haven't cleaned up after myself after uh, running through it, as sometimes I don't. <laughs> so I'm going to go ahead and delete anything that I might have left out there. And as you can see here, I'm doing a CF push. Uh, here's the container name, once again, quote service. And the dash O for Docker, Docker, right? We're not only bad at naming things, we also are bad at creating flags. Uh, actually, the, the dash D was taken. It's not, it's not our fault. Uh, but, but I always kind of remember it with the docker, so you know, take that as, a, as you will. And I'm, I'm pointing again to the same uh, docker image out on the docker public repo. Oops, scrolled it up. I'm giving it a memory target of one gig, and PCF dev does the rest. It spins up a container based on the same image, and it gives me the, uh, the endpoint that I can then curl and make sure that my application is running. I have a container running, and that's great. Same thing. Now I'm going to scale it, tell it I want two containers running based on the same image, and it does that for me. So now I can see that I have two, well, one running, one starting. So we'll assume it'll spin up pretty quickly. Uh, I'm also going to do a CF logs uh, so I can see what happens behind the scenes. This tails my logs so that I can see as I hit the endpoint four times, that it's actually hitting both containers, both nodes. No smoke and mirrors here. So we get four different quotes. And as you can see, uh, let's see here. Did it scroll too fast? Yeah, let's see. Well, I think it did scroll too fast, so I'll just go ahead and continue, because otherwise I'm afraid I'm going to run out of time. I'm going to go ahead and shut it down now and go back to the wrap-up screen, because that's where the last bit of key information lies. So why should I care, or should I? Well, containerization gives you a lot of different things. Uh, that we are always searching for in terms of develop development and deployment. It gives you consistency and portability. 
Uh, you can integrate all of these various different options with your CICD, CICD pipelines. There are excellent communities behind all of these offerings. Uh, so when you run into issues, you're not stuck out there stranded by yourself. Uh, there's a lot of transferability of school, skills. So various options are, some are more similar than others, but the worst case scenario, you'll have Okay, worst case scenario is you may have maybe 80 to 90% overlap versus the 98 to 99% overlap. So all of your skills are transferable even should you uh, uh, start with one option and decide to transfer your, your knowledge to another. Uh, the nice thing is that most of these are, are so overlapping that in terms of basic containerization, your decision is not that important there. Where it becomes important is day two ops manageability, patching, things of that nature, because that, and that's more on the operations side. So we really do appreciate the skilled operators who keep this running. Uh, it allows us to focus on, again, getting that real working software to production, which makes everybody happy, right? Here's kind of the ending. Uh, this is the GitHub repo, which has all the scripts that I use to run uh, in the various different environments, and of course my Twitter handle. So if there's anything I left out or treated too quickly and had to move on, please reach out to me and, and I'd love to discuss this at length. So thank you very much for coming. Enjoy Code Motion.